I just got back from uh, the second day of Portland Richard Gaming Expo. And we're going to do a bit of a con report for this, for the month, since, I'm, since I've been reshuffling how I do my schedule stuff, and since there was some Nintendo Power-related content here uh, at the convention. That part of the Nintendo Power-related content was on day two, so I'm going to push that back for a second and talk about day one first. So, day one of Portland Retro Gaming Expo um, was great. Uh, lots of panels that I went to that day. Uh, that was like probably the more panel heavy day of the convention. Um, bring up the schedule on my computer so I can remind myself what I went to. Um, we had some really interesting, um, so probably one of the more interesting, pan two more interesting panels I went to of th uh, that day was there was a arcade history panel by the artist who was sort of co-designer of Rampage. Brian Cullen. Um, now, Brian Cullen has worked on a lot of things. He worked he was an artist and designer on Arch Rivals, uh, General Chaos, Xenophobe, and so his panel was more heavily related to what he gets to describe as the visual and the, the art design aspect of making a video game, less the bits behind the scenes, <clears throat> somewhat pun intended, of, okay, how do you actually code the game and make it work in that respect, and more in the sense of Designing expressive characters for a video game, and also in addition to translating that to the um, promotional material to the arcade cabinet art and flyers and that sort of thing. Um, now, Colin has a background doing the um doing cartooning and that sort of thing before he started getting into game design uh at atari and so he kind of had that um i'm talking about belly midway rather so we kind of had that going for him before he got into the um game side of things and so it gave him a, a visual language and literacy that he was able to translate do that into game design and that sort and that sort of thing both character sprites as well as the art, and I, if you played Rampage at all, and I, I, I played the NES version for Nintendo Power Perspectives, I'll try to put a link to the correct episode in the show notes, um, and it, or Spy Hunter, or Xenophobe, and that sort of thing, or any of his other games, you know that his characters are very expressive and involved. Breaking for the arcade version, some of this translates over to the NES version with a certain degree of success, some more than others. I mean, Spy Hunter, it's a car. Uh, and so it, it's a lot. It's But with his games, it is different from, I guess you describe as the artistic aesthetic of, say, of Atari. Of the Atari 800, 2600 first party game box art. Where you had these very sleek design aesthetic um with well, also described as, as like color shaded color pencil art or the art design as opposed to airbrush and that sort of thing so it's it was an interesting th panel to go through um i will definitely say that the like certain game designers and such or people from the game industry, when you give them talk about the career, it's they basically say, oh, I went on for a bit, and then I retired, and, or, um, or, hey, I cashed up my shop, my stock options, so when, when my company, Atari or whatever, went, went under, I still had a pretty decent nest egg, and so I decided to retire at that point, or that sort of thing. Usually, like, when they went out, they were out. Um, Newman, his company, the game, 
um, Haven or the Haven um, Game Refuge. Yes, Game Refuge um, is still operating, but it's also like he's definitely more like. The games he's making are definitely not in the spaces that you and I and the people watching the show are necessarily moving in. Like, you are likely to see his work on a small game console thing at your table out of Buffalo Wild Wings or an Applebee's or that sort of thing. Then at, well, not Buffalo Wild Wings, Buffalo Wild Wings are expected you to watch the sports, but like an Applebee's or a TGA Fridays or that sort of thing. Um, as opposed to, you know, uh, even on your cell phone, it's it, like, it's in a way weirdly sub cell phone game in terms of like the designs of the type of gameplay and that sort of thing. It's something meant to keep you entertained for a brief period of time while you're waiting for your order to come in to, to be placed. When you're at the table, your food hasn't shown up yet and you've run out of things to talk about for a little bit. Um, that sort of thing. He doesn't explicitly say this, but from the, like, what the bits and bobs they show of the game, it's that sort of thing. He's also, they've done some mechanical stuff, or rather, um, software development stuff, is better to put it, for some, for Vegas gambling and that sort of thing. But, not much, he mentioned straight up that not much came of that because they developed the technology shortly before 9-11, then that happened, and the bottom fell out under Vegas, is how he puts it. Because people don't want to travel as much. So, that. <clears throat> but the next panel I went, after that, went to after that was my, had a lot more personal resonance to me. Um, we had a panel on the history of the Atari 800 computer, which, was, which is 40 years old this year. And I guess the way I'd put it is... I've heard my relationship with Atari 800 and such is if it wasn't for the fact like that Nintendo Power was the magazine that I read the most out of as a kid um or one of and I thought that NES games had kind of been a bit more resonant with online I might have done and um, gone through old issues, I might be doing a retrospective of old issues of Antic Magazine I do that and also like when I started doing the blog post and stuff, Nintendo Power had just ended as opposed to Antic Magazine having ended decades prior um, because the first computer I ever used uh, and like well, that, that was mine was an Atari 800 computer and I'd had um, Star Raiders, and I had, um, a Jedi lightsaber dueling, Star Wars lightsaber duels game, um, and I had a, um, and that, a few other cartridge games, and then I'd also gotten from a relative a giant box of floppies of dubious origin, with myriad games inside, and no documentation, which made some games more playable than others that sort of thing so when it came to so the Atari 800 was a big part of my childhood and also not to mention like for schoolwork and stuff the first paper I typed out for a school paper school project was a paper on Sweden I did in third grade and I printed it out on a um, Atari 800 computer have on dot matrix paper and that's what I handed in. So there's that. Um so that panel like was like one of the two panels for this convention that I was most interested in going to. And we had um go to cure and we had on the panel um David Crane who were both involved with the de design and development of the 800. Uh, Decor on the hardware side of things, um, Crane more on the software side, but also informing what they wanted the hardware to do, because 
basically the 800 and the 400 as well were designed from the get-go to be a hybrid game and person game machine and personal computer in a way beyond that of the pet and the apple II and that sort of thing that uh, like when for example one of the things i learned off the bat was that the atari 400 computers the one with the chiclet god awful keyboard that was meant to be a designated just straight up compute um gaming machine is you would have joysticks and that sort of thing it wasn't meant to have a keyboard interface and then the guy, one of the guys who designed the platform went on to make Star Raiders, which was a fantastic game, was an absolute, would be an absolute system seller. And I played a ton of it as a kid. And you can't play it without a keyboard. I mean, you need a joystick for flying the ship around and shooting the Cylon Raiders or that sort of thing. Um, but you needed the keyboard to handle zipping around from uh, sector to sector to hunt them down because you didn't play Star Raiders. It's a mix of like the seven late seventies, early eighties um, Star Trek clone games where you're going from uh, the, the mainframe game where you're going around from sector to sector, trying to line up, find the Klingon ships and fire a shot at them with not quite elite, but something kind of like that, where you have a first person perspective of your ship. You go around you go to star bases and you dock with star bases and that resupply and that sort of thing. And it's a flying and the docking with star bases is a um actual like flying around interface and you have to like manage your speed and that sort of thing when you do it. Because if you crash in the star base, your ship will take damage and you'll blow up the star base. And so on and so forth. So that part like that required a keyboard on the four hundred. And this also, um, but what I think this also because because the 800 and 400 were designed, unlike the Commodore and the uh, Apple II, to work with a television as opposed to a monitor, it meant that they had certain assumptions they could make right out of the gate. Their resolution was effectively going to be lower in terms of number of character the, the character grid on the screen, but you are a but. Because you worked up to a television, you are guaranteed out of the gate to have color and sound. Um, it's probably at this point in time, you know, you're going to be mono sound, but that's okay because you're probably not going to be able to do stereo output anyway. Um, and you know, you're going to have um, the level of color of the, the basic color televisions of the seven of the late seventies, early eighties, but you got color. And you can means you can do a lot more with that for output, and this leads into other stuff like okay, you can do higher like a, a larger character output for monochrome than you can with color, and this that and the other thing. So it it, it was neat to see that panel. Um, it's learned some stuff they didn't know about before, like because the eight hundred and four hundred were designed to hook up to a television at that time. That meant that. And through R through the RF connections on the TV, this meant that they had to go through more rigorous FCC RF interference stuff um, and for protections in order to put the thing out. And they had to put a basically a big metal Faraday cage in there, which limited the ability to install expansions to, to provide the option for expansion slots and that sort of thing. Whereas the Apple II and the Commodore didn't have this problem because they were supposed to hook up to a monitor. And so they had the availability of expansion cards and that sort of stuff. And it wasn't until like a later revision of the 800, the 800 XL, I think is the one I had as a kid, where they were able to do without the Faraday cage and have the option for an expansion slot. So there's that. Um... On the last panel I went to that evening was the live panel for Watch Out for Fireballs. Uh, they're talking about um, hidden gems, like their hidden gems, um, which I'm not going to give that away. If you want to listen to the episode of the podcast, go to duckfeed.tv and subscribe to the Watch Out for Fireballs podcast feed. And if you want to hear it sooner, subscribe to their, Pat subscribe to their Patreon. I'll, links to that will be in the show notes below. 
Um, they are not paying me for this plug. No, this is not a hashtag advertisement. So, uh, but I will give mine, my, my three hidden gems thus far. Um, one of which is going to be a, a reproduction cartridge, and the other two are not. Um, first off is Wizardry 1, 2, and 3 Legacy of Legamen for the Super Nintendo. Team, uh, Super Nintendo. Um, this is a combined version of Wizardry 1, 2, and 3 with well, for the Super NES. And by putting it on this platform, it has a lot of quality of life improvements that you don't normally expect or get for like other releases of these games. Like the PC version of these three games collected in Japan also has these quality of life improvements, but not any of the US collected versions. Like you get stuff like um textures for the walls, like or sprite maps for the walls, as opposed to blank uh um, wireframes, um, full sprite art for the monsters. You get, uh, if you're using the map spell, you're, you get, you, you can choose between coordinates and, or, or a actual drawn out map of where you are in the dungeon and where you've been, which if you are doing a, it, like if you're, Drawing out your own map is incredibly helpful for when it comes time to check your work. So that is incredibly valuable to have. And on top of that, there, um, like it has stuff built into it to let you carry your characters between games right out of the right out of the gate. Um, so it's probably one of the best versions of the first three Wizardry games to worth that that you can pick up. Um, in an emulator that is because the game the game was released in Japan through what was called the Nintendo Power Service um, this is a software platform which if you're familiar with the stuff with the um, Famicom disk system where you put the have your Famicom floppy disk and you get your blank ones and you load it in there and it automatically load a, a, a game uh, from the uh, basically vending machine onto your blank Famicom Disk System disc. And there's a small variety of games that were available that way. Um, this is like that, except it wasn't a disc. It's an actual cartridge that could hold, like, four games, I think. Um, and like the probably most well-known of this in these was uh, Mario & Wario, the original one, uh, was, I believe, put out through the Nintendo Power platform. But this one is... But well, a Wizardry Legacy of Legamen 1, 2, and 3 also went through there as well. And so of, as far as um, HD remakes, so to speak, or compilation things from the 16-bit era are concerned, this is one of the ones that didn't make it to the U.S. that I kind of wish we'd gotten. Related to this, Al, um, is the... Sega Genesis version of Might and Magic 2. Um, because Might and Magic 1 and 2 are visually very, like on the PC, having done an article on them for Hardcore Gaming 101, Might and Magic 1 and 2 on the PC are very visually flat. Uh, much as with the versions of these games that we got on the um, for like PC compared to console for like Wizardry and that sort of thing. PC versions tend to be more um, like there is some side art sort of things going on for um, showing dungeon rolls and that sort of thing because you need to tell when you're in a dungeon, when you're in a city, when you're in a castle, when you're in a a uh, uh, out in the woods and the forest and then different types of terrain and that sort of thing. It's a step up from, for example, wizardry and a little bit of a step up from a rid for, from OG, the Bard's Tale. I don't know if the Bard's Tale was out at the same time, but it's still kind of blah. Whereas with the 16-bit console version of Might and Magic 2, 
you're getting a much more heavy graphical overhaul. Additionally, for most of both of these games, when it comes to location-based spells, you get, on the PC version, you got coordinates instead of a map, which, with the size of the world of Might and Magic, that it's not the more confined environment of the wizardry dungeons, um, coordinate-based um, location spells become less useful from a where the heck am I, how do I plot up my route standpoint. Whereas with the cons console versions, this is the case of the NES version of Might and Magic Book 1, but also with the Genesis version as well, you get also a map. You get a record of where you've been. It's not annotated necessarily by, any, by the same means as a map you draw yourself, but it's a step in the right, but it's an improvement, and it gives you the basis of checking your work for your own dungeon maps, and that sort of thing. And the third, uh, this is one I've talked about and lauded heavily back on the episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, where I talked about the multi-tap issue of uh, Nintendo Power. Yes, and there, there's a theme here of first-person dungeon crawlers, um, but I'll link to this episode in the show notes as well, is... Swords and Serpents, which it's a console game that was only made for consoles by Brian Fargo, a creator uh, who is now known and beloved for the creator for Fallout 1 and 2, one of the creators of the Bard's Tale, that sort of thing, a legendary, also Wasteland, like he's a legendary game designer, uh, and particularly when it comes to RPGs, and he did a multi-tap-based RPG uh, as a dungeon crawler for the for the NES and one of the things it did he did with the game was out of a password based system for the characters and what this effectively allowed you to do is to take your character over to a friend's house and have them take part in that campaign in in their game that way and the thing is if you're familiar with how D D got played way back in the day, like early on in, in the history of D D, that happened a lot in people's D D games. People would take characters from their friends' campaigns over from one game to another, and so you'd have somebody come in with your into your RPG game with their level fifteen uh, paladin who has a um, a sword, a, a holy of, holy avenger sword. And his mighty steed, and also has had gone a few rounds on deck of many things, and had some pretty good luck there too. And so their stats are pretty awesome, and they've also had a few witches cast on them, and they are super OP. Uh, whereas everyone else is like at Conan's level or Fafford the Green Mauser level equipment of, yes, my my sword has a name, and I call it, um, uh, I call it scalpel. It's also just a regular sword, and I've replaced it like twenty times right now by in the past. And nobody's really got much magic items here. You're the only guy here who's like loaded to the gills with magic, that sort of thing. So that was an incredibly interesting thing. There was one of the few cases where a console role playing game was trying to replicate in a game sense what some of the experience of actual tabletop play, not in the terms of logistics or in terms of the like the level of freedom of choice, because for a PC or for a console RPG of this vintage, you couldn't necessarily get that. You couldn't have the freedom of choice of a Baldur's Gate of a Baldur's Gate or a Planescape Torment or even some of the later Ultima games on the NES, but you could do this aspect, which I appreciate. After this, I went to my first meetups I've been gone to for a podcast in a while for um, the uh, duckfeed.tv community at Quarterworld. I had a blast. I had never been to Quarterworld before. It is a fun arcade. Um, I'll put a link to their location in the show notes as well. Um, 
As far as for, if you're coming to visit Portland and you're looking for a place to check out, it's a little trickier to get to by mass transit, I would say, than, um, say, ground control. But on the other hand, ground control, like, they've been doing some remodeling recently, haven't been there in a while. And normally for Heart for. Portland Merchant Gaming Expo, they have a lot of their stuff at the expo as well, so six to one, half dozen the other. Uh, so Quarter World's definitely worth checking out. Quarter World's also, like, from a, a barcade standpoint, for the bar part of the barcade, they're kind of better off there. Well, I'm like, oh, you have a small but decent food selection, um, plus cocktails and beers and that on tap and that sort of thing. So there's that. Um, is a loud place and like in turn in the sense of like loud music, not a lot of like it is actively difficult to put on a to maintain a conversation there. Um, so that is something to keep in mind if you have sensory issues or that sort of thing. Day two, I missed the first panel I meant to go to, wanted to go see, which was on the making of. Uh, Alien vs. Predator for this Atari Jaguar, because that game is one of the more highly regarded games for that console. Um, and the the diamond, one of the diamonds in the rough of a game library that has a lot of dire titles to it. Um, I'm a little bummed, but that's okay. Like, of the games on the Jaguar's library, probably the one I'm more interested in Make sure that I've got the right platform here. I believe there was a version of Space Hulk. Or the Jaguar. No, it wasn't the Jaguar. Uh, was it this the, the 3DO? Or... No, it was the 3DO, which had a Space Hulk adaptation. Okay, never mind. All right. So, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, the, the game library for the Jaguar is notoriously bad. Um, the version of Alien vs. Predator, like, the Alien vs. Predator for the Jaguar is clearly one of its high points, but still kind of a... That's not necessarily saying much, considering the state of the Jaguar's game library. I was interested in seeing that, because um, I believe the developer of that uh, was Rebellion, and they also worked on the later PC version, which is a significant improvement, but that's okay. The more important um, between um, that panel, or the one I got there, and then the, uh, the panel I did get a chance to go to, I did check out the Video Game History Foundation Museum. And there's some really good exhibits there. I'll put some pictures up on the screen here. We had some really neat stuff. Um, this year is the anniversary of the release of the Game Boy and of the Sega Genesis. So there were some significant exhibits there related to both, more so for the Game Boy than the Genesis. There was a full Genesis library available for display. Uh, but the Game Boy section was more extensive, uh, with various snapshots from the history of the Game Boy, from like a um, display unit set up with Game Boy Tetris to examples of some of the productivity software that was intended to put that was put out for the game that talked about in the show because they brought it up in Nintendo Power as well with like a dictionary and appointment tracker, weights and measures stuff and that sort of thing. But probably the bit that was more even more interesting was they had a section there on the Nintendo Power uh Nintendo Game Counselor's hotline. We had a uh, sample desk set up with like basically what it, what the Game counselor's work area would look like. Um, games, uh, a small television with the console set up. You had um, notes, very extensive notes for very for how to get the various um, stuff in the game. Um, we had bits of the documentation that the game counselors would have available to them. I believe some of this is related to the binder that. Um, among other things, and so their documentation stuff that Metal Jesus received. 
Uh, he had, did a video on this. Another link in the show notes below as well. Try to remember to get all these. Lots of stuff to link to. Um, but since I'm working off the cuff. But so that like stuff like that. And they also had their ex- a selection of game counselor jackets, which is something I didn't know about, and I don't think Mel Jesus had talked about either. Um, Nintendo game, and I didn't see much documentation of what it took to get one of these. Was it like a seniority thing? Was it having taken part in, like, say, oh, you were part of the N64 launch, you were part of the uh, Super Nintendo launch. Um, you were there for the release of Metroid, or that sort of thing. Um, I'd be interested to know what, what circumstances led to you getting what vests. But the vests were or jackets were neat because they remind me, as, as a wrestling fan, of the Ribera Steakhouse jackets. If you're not familiar with, with what that is, um, there is a steakhouse in Japan. I want to make sure it looks up and get the name right. Yeah, Ribera Steakhouse. They are... Uh, Steakhouse in Tokyo. They have, they have these like satin jackets, and like various American wrestlers have started like in the seventies started going there. Um, Stan Han like there's a little debate on on who was the one who discovered it. Chris Jericho credits Stan Hansen. Stan Hansen credits Bru- Bruiser Brody. Bruiser Brody isn't with us, otherwise he might credit somebody else um, for introducing him to it. I don't know. Um, but the guy embraced having been adopted by the Gaijin wrestling community and with various views of paraphernalia and certain patrons get this jacket. It's a satin jacket and it has a steakhouse logo on the breast, another logo on the back. Um, and it's basically a sort of like the, the rite of passage where if you've made it as a pro wrestler who's toured in Japan, you get this jacket. And the and the game counselor jackets remind me a lot of that. So I'd be interested to see oh I I did not see again see any documentation there for what it took to get these jackets to earn them, but it, I'd be interested to see how that came about. In any case, that's my thoughts for Portland Virtual Gaming Expo. I've been going on for about half an hour, so I will call it here. Um, pickups were pretty decent. Picked up a couple N64 games. I'm planning to get, like, I have an N64, which I need to get properly hooked up. I need to get the Eon adapter so I can get get it hooked up to my TV. And other than, and picked up some uh, PS2 games and such. So, any case, I'll I'll be updating my um, collection information with that. If you're a Patreon backer and you want me to play one of the games that I have um, in my collection for a Let's Play, certain Patreon backer levels, you can choose that. So keep that in invi- under advice in, in mind, what have you. Catch you later. Almost forgot. So the let's start that over. Almost forgot. So, the last panel I went to today, and I can't believe I forgot this, because this is part of the reason why I'm doing this, not necessarily in lieu of a Nintendo Power Retrospectives video, but supplementing a Nintendo Power Retrospectives video. Howard Phillips was one of the, had a panel um, on the second day of the convention with Frank Cifaldi of the Video Game History Foundation, a group that you should, a nonprofit you should absolutely be supporting. And Phillips talked a lot about his time at Nintendo. Um, like, I think this panel could have been a double-length panel. Um, there was enough stuff that they didn't get a chance to get to that they didn't get to. Um, talked about um, leading up to the launch of the... Uh, talked about, well, be- at the beginning with... Uh, Howard getting brought on board at Nintendo, basically originally just to run the warehouse, um, trying out the games and that sort of thing, and helping determine what games got brought over to the U.S. And that's oh, not, not the sole decider of this, but one of the people providing feedback 
uh, for what Nintendo arcade games would be brought out in the U.S., um, in part because, like, he, he had a prominent voice, but that's not necessarily saying a lot, because at this point, Nintendo had, like, five permanent employees, including him, and he was number five. So, is that, um, so, leading into the, I think, not, and not just, like, testing out, um, the arcade game, but also Game & Watches as well, and then when the Nintendo Entertainment System, rather the Famicom, was sent over, doing his feedback on that and determining that, yes, this is something that I think that he felt would do well in the U.S. market, just that the timing was not right yet, and Arakawa um, deciding to hold it back, basically, because at the time that it came out in Japan and got sent over to the U.S. market, um, was in the middle of the video game crash of 84. So not the best time to be releasing a home console system. Um, Phillips is a amazing interview um, to listen to. He, like him and Frank Zafaldi uh, had great chemistry together. I mean, Zafaldi, longtime staple of the Retronauts podcast, was great there. Here, he's also similarly, like, great, um, but him and Phillips have uh, interview chemistry that is almost unmatched, like, the, uh, in terms of how, of uh, feeding off each other and giving a sense of Howard Phillips, who he, of, who, who he is as a person. Um, there's a, a few days ago, before I went to the convention, I was listening to an episode, uh, podcast interview with Terry Gross, host of Fresh Air. Um, and what Terry Gross mentions in the interview, in, in her interview, she's talking about her career as an interviewer hosting Fresh Air, is that not, not all people who have interesting stories are interesting interviews, um, is basically how she puts it. And Howard Phillips is a person where, like, you get little sound butts and bites of him from like on video game years and that sort of thing. We'll give like a snippet of a story and that sort of thing, but getting like uh, to spend an hour with him and letting him talk and asking him questions and him expanding on points is a very different experience from what, from that. And he really presents the story presents what's going on, what was going on at, at Nintendo at this time incredibly well. Um, and, like, he provided a better portrait of Arakawa than I'd gotten from a lot of other, like, books um, of the time. Like, stuff like Game Over and that sort of thing, like David Schiff's books, provide a certain degree of elaboration on Arakawa's personality, but... It's different when you're getting a firsthand description of the person by, from someone who'd work with them in day-to-day -day life. Um, and that was very valuable. We got a little bit of a discussion of the launching of Nintendo Power and Phillips' role in that. And what led to also to his lead decision to leave Nintendo. Um, he has basically... He was getting moved into more of a PR role, and I got not, I'm not going to put words in his mouth. I'm not going to expand on it like, too much because it's a tr it's he basically brought up in the uh, um, panel that like stuff like console wars by doing a fictional not so much fictionalization but a novelization of the historical events provides a misleading interpretation of what happened historically um, from how it's presented in the interview here um, at the panel Phillips basically says like hey at Nintendo I was getting moved into more of a PR role as a face of the company as opposed to in game production and development which is what I wanted to do and so that's why I was choosing to leave when so when Sega tried to recruit him, he had been promised, oh, you're going to be in a more development role. But as he was kind of getting wind of things, like, no, this is going to be how heavily PR again. And that's ultimately led, what led to his second thoughts. 
And it makes sense for Ryan why in turn his ultimate decision was to go to LucasArts, where, hey, that is much more that's a software focused company. They're not trying to score points on Nintendo or with Nintendo or that sort of thing. They're not they are both publisher and developer in that respect. So um that and so it, it kind of led to some of the re- it reinforced some of the reservations I have about console wars as a book. Because the thing with console wars is unlike Masters of Doom by Kushner, um or that sort of thing. It's a presentation of these stories uh, done in a novel in a very novelized fashion with the with um, Tom Kalinsky as point of view character and occasionally ejecting him. It feels like in circumstances where he may not have been present. And I think that and it, it makes the book feel less useful as a historical text and I'm glad to have like some reinforcement of that in that regard because it's I mean, it's a book that purports to be historical text but has no bibliography put it that way in any case um, it was an excellent panel next to you and I feel like there's much more that could have been told but on the other hand like we had 45 minutes. I feel like this was a panel that could have been an hour and a half and we st- and I still have been wanting more. I do hope that we get a an extensive interview with uh on like the Retronauts podcast where we just get like Safaldi and Par- Jeremy Parrish and um uh Bob and all of them and to just sit down with um, Howard Phillips and just ask him questions and let him talk for hour and a half, two hours and get this and, and let, let him tell stories about this period of the game industry. So, and also related to this, I do hope that we get similar that if Gail Tilden wants to talk about this portion of her career, um, that we that she's able to make it to a Portland Richard Gaming Expo at some point in the future as well, because from what we got from the uh, panel from Phillips, um, Tilton was more involved in terms of putting together the structure of Nintendo Power, and that's something as as a person who does a show about Nintendo Power, that's something I want to learn a lot about. So, and with that, we will actually be wrapping up this episode or this vlog episode thing. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>